This is Oogie Boogie's metal skeleton. This is an animator literally melting the guy with the melty face every time they set up for a shot. And this is a production still of Henry Selick standing inside the Halloween Town fountain. We sometimes build in trap doors so that they can physically open up a section of the stage, come up, do the animation, close the trap door and disappear. From hand-drawn fire to actual real fire, from ball sockets to face masks and liquid latex, the making of, no, the construction of a feature film like The Nightmare Before Christmas is an absolute marvel. This is the episode I've most been looking forward to in this series. A chance to immerse myself as much as possible in the guts of the animation process. Specifically the parts that get your hands dirty. So let's get into it. The Nightmare Before Christmas employed over 100 production staff. They shot with up to eight camera crews at times, using 230 sets and over 200 individual character puppets. The entire production lasted three years, and the results speak for themselves. Let me show you. So going into this video, my goal was to get down and dirty in the practical minutia dispel some misconceptions that I had, and answer some very specific questions. You know, as an animation producer myself, the kinds of questions that I would ask about materials, workflow, and structure. And along the way, I'll just point out a couple of truly wonderful things I had never realized about this movie. So let's talk about the actual physical materials involved in this process. We love the end result, but what's it all made of? The short answer, basically, is plastic. When it comes to the sets, many scenes start out life as smaller scale models, then plywood mock-ups, before being fully fabricated and painted. We do either a scale drawing, like a quarter scale drawing of the thing, but that then goes straight to set design. Greg Olson will make a scale model based on our drawing start to work out the camera angles, how much set is needed. If this was an actual set, it would be four times as large, which means this would be about 24 feet long. For space considerations, we start with something small and simple. Here's a rare photo of the iconic Graveyard Hill. You can see it's been built up with lots of flat planes, and then they've sealed and smoothed the joins with polyfiller. And this will have then been sent to the next department for fine modeling. In interviews with the crew, they talk about coating huge areas of the landscapes in layers of clay so they can texture them. We took sets and actually spread clay on them or plaster and then scribed lines all over them to give it that sort of etched textural feel. We can reasonably assume other pieces, like flat sides of houses, are simply cut, glued and painted plywood. When it comes to the characters, we go from drawings to 3D models. We might also make what are known as maquettes. In the early stages, a maquette can help the artist lock in on the details and scale of a character and get everyone on model so every drawing and sculpture going forward is consistent. This is common practice in 2D animation as well. Then they make the production scale character models. For both of these, we're using a polymer clay there are lots of different brands of this, but one that got mentioned is Sculpey. However, we don't stay with clay. I've often, you know, conflated the term claymation, but the final production characters aren't made of it. The clay models are used to create plaster molds, so that's casting plaster, also known as plaster of Paris. And the molds are injected with a liquid foam latex and then baked. Again, there are a few different suppliers of this, like Creature Foam Latex and GM Foam. Once the latex models are dry, they move on to the fabrication team for decoration and painting, most likely acrylic paints, but there's going to be a huge mix of materials here. We put the different paint jobs or clothing, hair, fur, um, everything else that gives the puppet its, its full character. Diving deeper into this process helped me shake off a bit of confusion I had, you know. I think like a lot of viewers, I was comparing the magical results I was seeing on screen with my own limited experience working with cheap modeling clay. It clumps, it dries out, it can be really difficult to work with, and it doesn't stay bendy. Something didn't quite add up. 
but the results here, particularly because of the foam latex, are so different. It's the reason they can be posed so easily and hold up under so much repeated movement. After a while, you know, they're gonna start to crack, or at least the paint on the top layer will. You can sometimes see this with Oogie Boogie in particular. But they're incredibly hard-wearing, lightweight, and malleable. As someone who's never really done visual effects or makeup or, you know, anything where I would be coming into contact with these materials, it really opened my eyes. The way the body and facial movements are handled is equally fascinating. No two characters are the same. To start, you've got an armature, a custom-built metal skeleton made from rods and sockets. This is laid inside the mold when the latex is injected, so it's baked inside the character. In a movie like this, every character is so wildly different, so their armatures all look different too. This is Oogie, this is Jack, and I'm pretty sure this is the werewolf. He's all alone up there, locked away inside. There's a kind of reverse engineering that's always taking place here. The model makers are given drawings of the characters, and from those, they have to figure out what their skeleton looks like. And you can see this even more clearly when it comes to facial expressions. The speaking characters in this film, their mouths articulate in completely different ways. There's no single standard way to do it. And in fact, Henry Selleck recommends you vary your approaches. What I like to do on the, on the, the movies, and it goes back to Nightmare, um, is mix it up. Don't use one technique for all the characters. Lead characters, uh, in particular Jack and Sally, we want to do the replacement faces um, to give them very specific expressions that were on model that any animator could use and they would still be in character. For example, Sally's face is a detachable mask. This is mostly because of her hair. So for each new look, they're posing the body and the head, then popping the face on and off. You will be a decided improvement over that treacherous Sally. With the mare, you can actually see really clearly that half his face just slides out like a jigsaw piece. With Jack, because he doesn't have any natural creases or lines for that sort of thing, his whole head comes off. We might use as many as 400 distinctly different Jack heads. And the team has to keep them organized and numbered. One thing that really stood out to me from the featurette is how they animated his singing in isolation ahead of time, which you can see here. They took just his head and animated all the singing so that on the actual shoot, the animator can just go down the list, avoiding any lip sync mistakes. I've been asked, how do you make a character blink? Um, for Jack, we have uh, these replacement series. So what I do is just take these, place them into Jack's eye. And so I do that for both eyes, take the frame of film, and then put the closed eye in. Uh, I might do this for three frames. You know, so you're getting very quick action of a, a, just a, a blink, which brings the character to life. Nothing is done the same from character to character. There are even lots of different ways to move a character's eyeballs. The two most common being, if their eyes are roughly spherical and capable of independent movement, you take a pin and you poke it into the black of the pupil and maneuver it that way. If not, you have the pupil itself be a loose item, so just the black dot can move about while the white stays still. Have I lost you yet? At this point, I think I may only be speaking to animation students, but that's fine. Making a project at this scale is an intense logistical challenge. And something that always blows me away is remembering how clearly and rigorously the labor is divided, at least during the busiest production stages. For any given scene, we need to map out Jack's faces ahead of time, and that needs to be ready for the animator to reference before they reach the soundstage. That Jack he's posing was sculpted and molded and fabricated with all the finishing touches. Except we actually need half a dozen Jacks, because we're actually shooting three different scenes with Jack simultaneously on three different sound stages. We have as many as 20 stages going at once. One animator's working with Jack climbing a tower, and another's working with Jack walking through the woods, and a third's working with Jack singing out in the streets. There's no single Jack, and there's no one room where the magic is happening. Because if you've done it right, you have a small village of people all bustling around, building and painting and shooting different parts of the same project. Preparing for this video also reminded me of something I think is so crucial in animation. 
and that's that animators are actors. This is a distinction that's really important to me, and I think it's a way of thinking you need to understand if you want to work in the industry yourself. At that point, the animator becomes the character. We talk about performance, even with animated characters, but if you ask most viewers to clarify what they mean, they'll say the voice acting. However, unlike in live action, where every part of what we call acting is done by a single person, an animated character's performance is a combination of multiple people's work, separated by both geography and time. At every point along the road, you have a new chance to add detail. Another person leaves their fingerprint. Sometimes, you know, literally. So Jack Skellington's performance comes from Chris Sarandon, Danny Elfman, Trey Thomas, Mike Belzer, Owen Klatt, Angie Glocker, and all the animators who had a chance to work on him. As one last point, I love seeing how the craft changes and evolves over time. Stop motion features like this are relatively few and far between, so lots of these processes stay the same in a kind of stasis until the next project comes along and gives them an opportunity to change. It's similar in visual effects. The techniques leap forward with incredible speed only when a new Star Wars or Avengers film comes along to bankroll that progress. The cameras might change, the computers might change, but the craft shifts at its own weird pace. Something amazing I learned during all of this, you know, I watched a lot of Q&As and introductions that people had been nice enough to film and put on YouTube, and they often talked about the puppets on subsequent movies like Corpse Bride and Frankenweenie, which are like more advanced in really crazy ways. No part of Victor's head from Corpse Bride needs to be removed when he talks, because inside it is this amazingly intricate mechanical skull. And you take like a little Allen key and you poke it in his ear to change his mouth shape or eyebrow placement. It's in fact incredible! So over the decades since Nightmare was released, you can see specific parts of this process getting refined while many of the foundational elements of the craft stay the same. Nowadays, you don't need to wait for your film to be processed. You can preview straight away. But you're still going to be molding and squirting latex and brushing goo on stuff. Which is half the fun. Having an excuse to get into the weeds with the animation on this film was an absolute pleasure for me. There's so much more to learn, and what's great is, these people love to talk about it. Animators and model makers and engineers love answering questions about their craft. And if you have the time, there's so much out there for free for you to find. I'll link a few videos I enjoyed in the description. And I hope I helped in some small way to demystify the process for you. I also sincerely hope that, like with me, this hasn't spoiled anything. It's only deepened your appreciation. Thank you once again for enjoying this episode of This Is Halloween. We're so close to 100,000 subscribers on this channel, so if you enjoyed this and you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe. 